Joining us right now is Jeffrey Sherman, co-CIO from Double Line Capital. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, thanks for having me today. So, um, Jeffrey, um, we're, we're, uh, we're late in the cycle. The Fed has pivoted. Uh, that's, that's old news. Yeah. Uh, they've gone dovish. Uh, today's a big decision day. And uh, the bond market has been pricing in a slowdown or a recession. Is the, uh, is the, first of all, do you think the bond market is correct in pricing in a recession? Yeah, well, that, that's the big question here yeah. at this point. Um, you know, I think when you look at where yields are today, it's not just the U.S., it's really the global go- uh, slowdown. And so what you've seen is bond yields rally across the world, really for the last, let's call it, you know, nine, nine months or so, really starting the fourth quarter. And so if you look at kind of pricing of the yield curve in the U.S., Um, What it's saying is, effectively, the Fed needs to cut rates. Um, That's all up to debate on what that timing is of the Fed cut. Um, You mentioned today that the Fed starts to meet today. The decision gets announced tomorrow. And the market's not really pricing in a cut for tomorrow. And it's a a tough position for Mr. Powell to be in, uh, being the chairman. And the bond market putting this pressure and saying that you should should cut rates. Um, But I think that uh, Mr. Powell's going to try to be data dependent. He's going to talk about having the tools available. Uh, what you saw today is uh, Mario Draghi, the head of the ECB, come out and say all those things once again. And so what you've got is another kind of um, an- another set of momentum behind the bond rally. It hasn't moved significantly in the U.S., but now you have the market in, in the eurozone pricing a cut again. So uh, you say recession. Uh, I, I don't say the bond market's priced in a full recession yet. Right. Um, but the slowdown. Def- the slowdown is there. Yeah. Uh, that's undeniable. There's mixed sets of data out there today. And so when you look across the spectrum, you can kind of take some certain data points and argue, well, growth is still there. And you can take other data points and argue that we're on the precipice of a recession. So as a mixed bag, it says it's, I think it's a little too early to say we're in the recession, but we have the chance of slipping into one maybe in the next six to nine months or so. So now at Double Line, you run the uh, multi-asset and the derivatives uh, strategies. Uh, what, what, what is your outlook for the next, uh, the next little while, the next year or two? Yeah, well, I, it's, it's going to be a challenging environment. And I think that, again, uh, we've, we've been so uh, dependent on Fed policy, ECB policy, that um, it, it's kind of like a lot of the macro went out the window for yeah. many years. And now when, when things start to slow down, everybody's looking for the central banks to save us effectively. Like, uh, so <laughs> Mr. Powell, rates, yeah, yeah. to cut rates. And uh, I, I don't think that a 25 basis point or 50 basis point cut is going to save the world. Uh, but it's pretty much, uh, it, it's, it's showing that the market is saying that the Fed policy is too tight right now. Uh, the question is, does it stoke the inflation argument? I, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think, you know, it's, it's too early to position for the recession. I think what you need to do is have a balance in your portfolio today. And that's kind of a cheesy thing for people to say, but I think it's more important than ever because there is the risk to the upside in growth, right? Because everybody's yeah. pricing this momentum in. Right. Uh, the momentum has been very negative. And so what you want to do is say, what if, what if things turn around? You don't want to be fully positioned for the recession, but I think you've got to start thinking about you know, what can help you if, if indeed we are having this global recession. And uh, again, it's, it's tough to say right now that you really want to make dramatic changes because where are we sitting today? Well, rates have rallied, credit spreads have tightened, mm-hmm. equity markets in the U.S. are up. It's not like things are extremely cheap to position for these things. So I think it's more important than ever to kind of have a balanced mix, and you probably want to tilt towards one of these other views. And I, I would say, if anything, that's the cheaper side of the equation, it's pricing for uh, the growth side of the equation. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. But... Um, watching German boons and, and their tenure, you'll right. go more negative each day. Um, it, it doesn't set up for a, a good environment right now because essentially they're going to destroy their banking system by uh, just forcing their banks to, to earn these negative yields over and over, essentially bleeding money out. Both you and uh, the other Jeffrey, yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey <laughs> Gunlack. The more um, well-known Jeffrey, the more, of course. Well, yeah. you're, 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 you're both becoming, you're, you're becoming very well-known as well. You, you've both recently talked about that, that we're in a bear market. Are we in a bear market? Well, I mean, stocks are struggling to set new highs. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at the global equity market, I'd say it's close to a bear market. It's definitely not setting new highs. Right. It peaked um, back in January of 2018. Uh, so it's really tough to say that you're in this strong bull market mm-hmm. globally. 
Um, so the S&P and 500 in the U.S. equity markets, the NASDAQ, um, what you've seen there is that they've had very strong performance. There was a big tax plan in the U.S. last right. year um, that helped both corporate and individuals. Um, but we have and no. Would you say that was successful? Uh, well, I mean, it, it was, it's short-term successful. Yeah. I, I, if you if you use the equity markets barometer, as as some yeah. of our leaders in the U.S. have have done. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, the the thing is, is that leadership has changed yeah. recently, right? If you take a look at it, um, the fangs and, and the things that were the darlings of the stock market have suffered. And so, if you're going to be in a bull market, you need either the former leadership to get back to highs, right. or you actually need a new set of leadership and. Really, when you look across the U.S. economy, it's hard to ascertain what that new sector would be. So, so how, do you, how do you get around the uh, concern of, of, of not knowing exactly what the next leaders are going to be? Well, by, you always have that, right? Yeah. I mean, by, by definition, you, 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 yeah. we don't, we're not clairvoyant. <laughs> no one really is. So how do you right? do it? How do you? Right. Well, so, yeah. I mean, when, when the thing that we run on our equity strategy, we run systematic. And so uh, we believe in the process. It's mm -hmm. one of those things that... Uh, we do a sector rotation product uh, that's predicated upon the research of Professor uh, Robert Schiller right. from Yale. And so um, it's something where you apply as CAPE ratio to sectors of the market and try to systematically find what, uh, what to believe are the cheaper sectors of the market. So um, that's one way of being able to do it is follow a systematic process um, that has been successful since we've launched it. It's been uh, about f a little over five and a half years, and it's been able to outperform it's the S&P. It's been doing very well. Yeah, it's yeah. done quite well. It's been able to outperform the S&P 500. So there's something to be said about um, having different types of strategies versus you know being outright stock picker, which I'm not. Yeah. Right. And so from that perspective, I, I learned it a long time ago. <laughs> Early in my career, I'm not good at picking stocks, right. so I shouldn't try to do it. Uh, more of a mathematician than, than a finance yeah. um, and accounting major. So from the standpoint of trying to uh, allocate capital, it's to be prudent, right? <clears throat> Don't chase. Um, you know, the momentum had paid you for a long time. Right. Uh, momentum just being an index fund, for instance, right? So um, perhaps at this point in the cycle, it's time for a counter trend. Maybe value makes a comeback. I mean, people have been saying that for many years. Uh, I don't think value's dead, um, but you know, there, there has right. been this, this has push. Right, this has been very challenging for, for it's been a very challenging market for value. It's been really a momentum-led market. Right, but we know that typically those things change in cycles. No one can ever yeah. call the end of it. And so you just have to be patient. So, um, you know, if you, if you don't like the way your portfolios are performing, what I like to always say is that then you probably have too much risk. Yeah. Right? And if you have too much risk, you, you can do something about it. And like I said at the, uh, at the onset, we've had highs in, in stock market prices. We've had credit spreads tighten. We've had yields rally. Uh, you have a chance to re-sculpt if you didn't like what happened in the fourth quarter. This is it. This is uh, this, this is a this time is to be able to do it. And so, look, you're, you yeah. may be early, you may be wrong a little bit, but if you didn't like the drawdown um, and you stayed in the market or you got back in, you have a good chance to re-sculpt. And, and that's the whole sure, idea. Some, some folks have said this is a sellable rally. This is an opportunity to pair back yeah. or, or rebalance. Right, and I think all eyes are on yeah. the Fed at this point. Sure. And how, how, does, how does Jerome Powell navigate it tomorrow? It's going to be very careful. So uh, we've been talking about a double line. <clears throat> we said is that yeah, you know, how are they going to finesse it? Well, I think the, yeah. the, the the thing is is that Powell definitely wants to get out of there as soon as possible. Right. You may see one of the shortest statements ever that he's written. His prepared remarks may be the shortest, and Less he's the looking to get out. Maybe uh, he'll say, "Oh, someone's giving a phone call in the middle of it. He's got to be you know, taken out of mm -hmm. it." So um, this won't be. I, I, we just don't think it's going to be drawn out. The more he talks, the more danger it is because it, it's like an interrogation. The longer you talk, the more you may say something Absolutely. that someone doesn't subject like. Subject to analysis and tearing and, him apart. And that's what we do because yeah. we're so we've been so dependent upon the Fed for so long and the ECB and the BOJ to provide the outs and the support to markets that every every word we hang on to say, oh, is there something different in the policy? But I think at this stage, you, you mentioned the pivot when we started. They pivoted to from being a hiking regime to at least a pausing regime. Yeah. Uh, the market thinks that turns into a dovish regime or a cutting regime. And so uh, I think that that's going to ultimately happen. But I think that Powell doesn't want to be perceived as being you know, slammed by President Trump, which Trump came out today right. uh, on the back of the Draghi comments. And, and President Trump said, you know, look, the ECB is cheating. They're devaluing their currency <laughs> through these stimulus yeah. measures. And, and we need to get with it, as mm -hmm. effectively he's doing. So uh, I think there's incentive for Powell to want to wait. Uh, if he is data dependent, you know, you can point to positives, you can point to negatives. Um, but if you look at their dual mandate, they're delivering unemployment. The, the inflation right. measure has been missing if you use their reported measure that they look at, which is this core PCE, or personal consumption expenditure. And when you look at a lot of the other core inflation measures, they're not strong, but they're around that 2% number. So the Fed can dance. 
right? And that's one thing we've they, learned. They, 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 yeah, they, they, they can change. They can change their targets. Uh, they had a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, where they were talking about changing perhaps policies. And so it's not some uh, systematic thing. It's not just some algorithm that they follow. They create models through time and some work, some don't. And uh, I think that their flexibility is something that's important at this stage, but I don't think it's going to be a game changer. Yeah. Do you think, is, are, are there any 800 uh, pound gorillas in the room? Do you, do you, like any uh, risks that, that that are unforeseen that, that you see or anything that, that you're concerned about? Well, I think we, we've been saying for a couple of years at Double Line that we think that the corporate bond market is just too big, right? right? It's too big, It has, and I'm talking about the US. The corporate bond market, especially the investment grade side, um, has doubled in size since the financial crisis. Um, it has higher leverage ratios than ever, especially for a given credit rating. Right. And what you find are spreads are tight. And people look at indices or look at the broad market and say, well, spreads have been tighter historically. But if you adjust for some of these leverage ratios and, and kind of the risk to that, that side of the bond market, um, spreads are not as tight as they would be perceived from just looking naively at a chart. Uh, but this isn't unknown to the market, it's something that uh, a lot of houses have been writing about this year. Um, and so I, I don't think it's an unknown risk, but I think some investors just ignore it and say, oh, well, the yeah. raise agencies have rated them invest rate. They must be. For the and default rate so low. Or, but yeah. when the default rate is low, mm -hmm. it doesn't go significantly lower. Yeah. Right. And so you have to still price in the ability uh, for there to be defaults. And look, I don't think that, you know, uh, the corporate bond market goes to this big default, which causes a recession. I think it's the other way around. Right, that, that the recession could lead into it, the slowdown. You get a curtailment in the consumer in the U.S., and you could have some problems. But you know, the consumer data, retail sales picked up again. The last brand, this is it. It's volatile on that on the macro mm -hmm. front, right. and volatility is just going to be that. Hopefully, there creates some trading opportunities there. But I don't think it's an unknown risk at this point. Uh, people thought we were crazy when we were talking about it, you know, roughly three years ago. Uh, but that's the idea is to try to get in front of it. Right. And look, you look foolish for a while. Spreads continue to tighten in. Uh, but if you think about when we were talking about that in 16, we just went through kind of this profit recession in the U.S. It was led by the energy sector, the commodity producers. And it looked like we we're going to have a global slowdown. Um, then we got through it. We muddled through it. And now here we are again. And everybody's looking for firepower somewhere. Um, and I'm just not convinced that uh, just it, rate cuts are the things that are going to be stimulative enough to get us through. Right. But at this point, like I said, you have a chance to re-sculpt if you're not comfortable with, uh, with that risk in the marketplace. So Jeffrey, when you were in, uh, going back now, when, when did you know that, that uh, you wanted to be in this business? <laughs> when did you first know? I know, you, you know, yeah. looking at your, at your, at your bio, you, you, know, you studied math. Yeah. You, you have uh, graduate degrees in math yeah. and, and uh, sciences, and, and uh, when, when did you first know, like what, what made you decide to get into this, into the business? Yeah, I mean, I went to graduate school and I was, I was doing a PhD program in applied math, as you said, and um, you know, I couldn't really find the application I liked. You right. know? I wasn't into the physics, um, I, it just never really interested me. I was doing statistics and things like that because it was the alternative, and then I stumbled across the finance side where you know, the finance world was trying to, you know, kind of like uh, the econo uh, the economists get, right? They right. had physics envy, you know, that you're trying to model all these things out. And some of it can be modeled, uh, but you have to understand that, um, you know, the model doesn't tell you everything. There is psychology. There's a lot of behavioral right. aspects. And, you know, it's just the psychosis of a market. And so, um, you know, I decided to apply the uh, finance side to the ma uh, from the math degree to the finance side. And I just started working the business. And so got in right. and, and figured, you know, you're young enough that if you don't like it, you can always re-sculpt and re-change, just like a portfolio, right? right. And so, um, you know, it's something that I was very interested in and did a lot of reading, did a lot of, um, you know, things across multi-sectors, uh, not just focus on one area, but just mm -hmm. trying to understand how the, the big picture all works together. And so uh, I feel like I'm still learning, right? Like all always, of us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, look, they have, there's no textbook on negative interest rates, at least not to my knowledge yet. And you know policies of negative rates. I mean, when I read the Fabozzi book, the Handbook of mm -hmm. Fixed Income, which is you know the uh, de facto guide for bond investors, there was nothing talking about that. It was like the zero lower bound. <laughs> you know, the duration is capped by that. Yeah. And all of a sudden now you've got to rethink these things. Now, I'm sure you know, Dr. Fabozzi's all over that, and mm -hmm. you know, going to get a new edition out. But uh, you know, so there's always new challenges to markets, and, and that's why I find interesting is that 
it's always puzzle, problem solving. It's a puzzle, and you know, n no market is, is unique, but there's a lot of similarities, right? Yeah. So I think that the thing that I would advise folks that want to do this is like you also have to study history, but you got to study. But the problem with studying history is that you look at it in a spreadsheet or you look at it from not being in the market. Right. And so what you what you miss from that that's that's uh, impossible to really figure out is what was the psychology of the market at that time. And I think if you can figure that part out, you can understand why there were these big drawdowns or you know how markets got overvalued, how you had bubbles both directions, right? To the growth side and to right. the massive depressionary side. So uh, it's trying to apply all these things together and, it's, and I found very interesting early on and I still do today. Fascinating. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Well, thanks for hosting it's me today. A pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise.